Hey there, this is part two of a two-part episode. If you haven't listened to part one, I recommend you do. Thanks. In 1609, the Italian scholar Galileo took a piece of military spy technology and turned it aloft toward the heavens. Human beings had been gazing at the skies for millennia by then, and they of course knew that the moon had light and dark splotches on its face, the man in the moon and all that. But when Galileo looked through his military spyglass, now called a telescope, he saw something different. Wow. Something new in human history. You see, during the 1600s, the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle was highly influential. People called him the philosopher, as if he were the only one that mattered. Among other things, Aristotle argued that heavenly bodies like the moon were perfectly spherical, with surfaces as smooth as polished mirrors. So everyone in the 1600s believed that as well. After all, Aristotle, the philosopher, had said so. Looking through his telescope, however, Galileo suddenly saw craters on the moon and valleys and mountains. The moon wasn't a smooth pearl at all. It was dynamic and rugged. Now, obviously, the telescope played a key role in this discovery. It allowed Galileo to see details hidden from the naked eye. The telescope, though, is only part of the story. You see, Galileo wasn't the first person to train a telescope on the moon. Other astronomers had seen the same details before. But if those other astronomers saw the same details, they failed to perceive them. That is, they didn't understand what they were looking at. So what made Galileo different? Galileo often gets called the first true scientist, and he was a pivotal figure, no question. But that's not how Galileo saw himself as a scientist. He was an accomplished musician and philosopher as well, even a literary critic. He had a true liberal arts education. In particular, he trained in a field that we rarely associate with science today. Because beyond all his other skills, Galileo was a gifted artist. And it was this training above all that allowed him to rewrite our understanding of the cosmos. Hi, I'm Sam Keen, and you're listening to The Disappearing Spoon, a topsy-turvy, sciencey history podcast, where footnotes become the real story. When Galileo went to university in the 1580s, he faced a very modern problem. His parents wanted him to be a doctor. As a musician, his father Vincenzo had a precarious income, and because Vincenzo was paying Galileo's bills at the University of Pisa, he pushed his son to be practical and enter medicine, to get a good, steady job. But Galileo was every bit as stubborn as his old man. He'd fallen in love with mathematics, and he wanted to pursue that instead. And Vincenzo actually sympathized here. While studying music theory, Vincenzo had learned a fair amount of math himself, and he'd been touched by the abstract beauty of the field. So in 1583, father and son compromised. Vincenzo agreed to pay for one more year of his son's tuition to study math, after which Galileo would be on his own. It didn't take long for the young scholar to make a splash. He, in fact, used his math skills quite brilliantly during a close reading of that beloved Italian classic, the Divine Comedy of Dante. Just like nowadays, most people reading the Divine Comedy then flip straight to the part about hell, the inferno. It's full of gruesomely clever tortures and lurid tales of debauchery and sin. It's more fun than the boring bits about heaven. And because Dante described hell in such detail, his fans were moved to reconstruct hell's geography and architecture. In doing so, these fans knew that Dante's hell was fiction. It was more like a game for them, like people making maps of Westeros today or inventing grammars for Klingon. They liked the immersion and the intellectual challenge. Galileo's first question involved Lucifer, <laughs> who was trapped in ice at the very bottom of hell. Dante described Lucifer as gigantic, and Galileo wanted to know exactly how big he was. Dante had left some clues. In an earlier circle of hell, he mentioned the giant Nimrod and said that Nimrod's face was as tall as a famous pinecone sculpture in Rome, near St. Peter's Basilica. 
Well, the pine cone stood 11 feet tall, and Galileo knew from his art training, which emphasized the proportions of the human body, that the human face is roughly one-eighth of our body length. So with an 11-foot face, Nimrod must have stood 88 feet tall. As for Lucifer, Dante mentioned that he was even bigger than Nimrod. Specifically, Lucifer's arms were longer than Nimrod's arms, to the exact same proportion and degree that Nimrod's arms were longer than Dante's arms. Dante stood roughly six feet tall, and again Galileo knew that our arms are roughly one-third of our height. From this, Galileo calculated that Lucifer must have stood three-quarters of a mile tall, over a thousand feet taller than the tallest building on earth even today. Pretty impressive. Next thing, Galileo turned to the structure and size of hell itself. Dante had described hell as one giant cone. Its tip was at the center of the earth, and its domed roof was part of the earth's surface. Based on more close reading of the text, Galileo determined that hell was 3,200 miles across, longer than from Maine to San Diego. Galileo then asked himself an imaginative question. Given that size, how thick would the domed roof of hell need to be to prevent it from collapsing? Now, Galileo actually blundered at first in answering this question. He started with the dimensions of an existing dome, the famous Duomo over the cathedral in Florence. That dome was 147 feet across and 13 feet thick. Then Galileo simply scaled that up for a 3,200 mile wide hell. This gave hell a roof of around 300 miles thick. But Galileo eventually realized that simple scaling wouldn't work, and would in fact lead to a catastrophic collapse. Here is why. The strength of a structure depends on the cross-sectional area of its supports. Area is a two-dimensional measure, length times width. So making a structure, say, twice as big, would increase its strength by two times two, or four times total. Not bad. Unfortunately, doubling a structure's size also increases its weight, and weight is proportional to volume, a three-dimensional measure, length times width times height. So doubling a structure's volume increases the weight by two times two times another two. That's eight times more weight. In other words, the weight, a 3D quality, always grows faster numerically than the strength, a 2D quality. And the more you scale something up, the further the strength lags. So if you want to prevent a roof from collapsing, you have to more than double the thickness to keep up. Now again, Galileo blundered at first in not realizing this, which I have to admit makes me feel a little better, to know that even the great ones make mistakes. But once he corrected himself, Galileo realized that the roof of hell would be so thick that there wouldn't be any room for the sinners below it. They'd be squashed. However beautiful a poet, Dante wasn't much of an architect. Galileo then extended these insights about area and weight and strength into biology. For example, he could suddenly explain why elephants have such chunky legs. Elephants weigh so much that their legs have to be disproportionately thick, with a larger cross-sectional area. They couldn't get by with thinner, normally proportioned legs, because their bones would immediately shatter. This fact also makes giant human beings impossible, at least normally proportioned giant human beings. A true giant would have to be much squatter than us, or it would collapse in a heap of pain after one step. As a quick aside, you might be wondering whether Dante's Lucifer, who stood three quarters of a mile tall, would also collapse under his own weight. And the answer is no. Not because he's supernatural, but because Lucifer is standing in the center of the earth where you'd be weightless. <laughs> so Dante got that one right. <laughs> Anyway, engineers and biologists still use Galileo's insights into area and weight when studying scaling today, and it all came from his reading of Dante, a virtuoso intellectual performance. And in some ways, this engineering insight was just a prelude into Dante's truly monumental fusion of astronomy and art. As a young man, Galileo had trained in painting and drawing at the prestigious Academy of Drawing in Florence. In particular, he studied chiaroscuro, 
the use of light and shadow. It's a bit of an oxymoron word, a portmanteau of the Italian words for clear and light, chiaro, and obscure darkness, oscuro. Nowadays, chiaroscuro is mostly associated with painters like Caravaggio and Rembrandt. These painters often spotlit the central figure in their works, with darkness enshrouding the rest of the canvas. You can see some examples of this on my website, along with the bonus episode for subscribers. More generally, chiaroscuro refers to the use of light and shading to create a sense of fullness and depth. Essentially, artists use shading and shadow to build three-dimensional images. This was the key technique that Galileo used to understand the moon. Again, Galileo wasn't the first person to study the moon through a telescope. Four months before him, in mid-1609, an English scholar named Thomas Harriot stayed up late one night and turned what he called a perspective tube toward the moon to see what he could see. Now, telescopes back then weren't the high-powered marvels of today. The magnification was fairly weak, so the details were somewhat hard to see and Harriet was not impressed with what he did see. Eh. He reported seeing only a strange spottedness up there, some splotches of dark and light. Like most people then, he explained these splotches as regions of different density within the moon. He saw nothing to overthrow Aristotle's age-old belief that the moon was a smooth pearl. But when Galileo picked up his telescope, he saw something different. He saw the scene as an artist would, with an artist's eye. He saw the moon lit by a point source, the sun, and the so-called splotches on its surface were really evidence of 3D features, craters and mountains and valleys, all of which break up the sunlight and cast shadows. To an artist, the moon didn't look smooth at all. It was pitted and craggy. Galileo then used his artistic skills to sketch what he saw with his own hands, producing some hauntingly beautiful images full of pale shadows. Galileo's eye was even sharp enough to estimate the size of a few mountains on the moon. He guessed four miles tall, pretty close to the true figure of 3.3 miles. Overall, Thomas Harriot was a smart guy, an accomplished astronomer and navigator. So it wasn't just brains that made Galileo a genius and Harriot an also-ran. It was Galileo's skill with chiaroscuro. His artistic training, in other words, made him a better scientist. If there's a better argument than that for a liberal arts education, well, I've never heard it. Galileo quickly published his drawings about the moon, along with other results he'd gleaned with his telescope. These included his discovery of sunspots, as well as his discovery of the four largest moons of Jupiter, the first new heavenly body since antiquity. But the moon results especially were not welcome in all circles. In Galileo's time, the perfectly smooth moon was revered as a symbol of purity. The moon was therefore associated with Mary, Jesus' mother. An artist commonly portrayed Mary atop the moon to emphasize her purity. In fact, Galileo's friend, the painter Cigoli, had planned to do a fresco of Mary standing atop the moon for the Vatican's Pauline Chapel, which sits next to the Sistine Chapel. Cigoli wanted to call the work the Immaculate Conception. But then Cigoli heard Galileo's discoveries about the rugged geography of the moon and all of fire. Cigoli decided to show the moon in his fresco with dimples and craters. If Galileo had first drawn on art to boost his science, Galileo's science was now bending back and influencing art. But however inspiring that art-science fusion sounds today, the Vatican was less amused. How could Cigoli dare place the all-hallowed mother of God on an ugly, pitted moon? It was a sacrilege. The Vatican ultimately let Cigoli's painting remain on display but they vetoed the Immaculate Conception as the title, since the moon in the fresco was far from immaculate. Instead, they made Cigoli call his work the Assumption of the Virgin. Now, this might all seem like a silly spat today, something to roll your eyes over, but it did foreshadow the trouble Galileo would later have with the Vatican over his heretical discoveries. In the short term, though, Galileo's work on the moon and other heavenly bodies rocketed him to stardom, making him the most famous scientist in Europe. And more than that, these discoveries helped overthrow the stifling influence of Aristotle on scientific thought. Aristotle and his disciples had always drawn a sharp line between the heavens and the earth. The earth was vulgar, low, corruptible. Dante placed hell inside earth for a reason. The heavens, meanwhile, were pure and eternal. 
In fact, Aristotle's ilk believed that wholly different laws of physics applied to planets and other lofty bodies. Things moved differently up there, behaved differently. Grubby earth physics simply could not apply to the heavens. Galileo swatted that idea down. Just like the earth, the moon had craters and mountains. It was governed by the same geological forces. Even the sun had sunspots and other blemishes. The heavens and the earth, he argued, were subject to the same laws. This idea of a unified heaven and earth was a big influence on Isaac Newton, who was born the same year Galileo died. Newton, of course, saw that the same law of gravity that made apples fall to the ground also kept the planets spinning around the sun. No one had made that connection before. And the idea of unification in physics still fires the imagination of scientists today. Einstein spent decades trying to unite all of physics into one grand theory. He failed, but modern physicists still dream of completing what Galileo began. If physics does ever produce a so-called grand unified theory of everything, we can trace it all back to Galileo's telescope. Or really, we can trace it back even further, to his days at the Academy of Drawing, patiently sketching objects and taking in everything he saw, light and dark, sun and shadow, and perhaps wondering to himself, when am I ever going to use this? To learn more, visit samkeen.com slash podcast. There, you can find more incredible stories from my books, or learn how to book me as a speaker at your school or event. Also, you can ask questions for me to answer on air, or suggest stories for future episodes. Finally, you can learn how to find transcripts, bonus episodes, and signed goodies there by becoming an official supporter. And if you like this podcast, please do your part to keep it alive by becoming a patron through samkeen.com slash podcast. I'm listener supported. Spread the word to others as well, both online and in person. Word of mouth means a lot. Also, subscribe in iTunes, Stitcher, or other places and leave a five-star review. Thanks for listening to The Disappearing Spoon.